Hello and welcome to Second Hand Stories. This is a place where I tell you stories. What kind of stories? Well, histories, mysteries, and unbelievable histories. Today's episode is extremely special. Um, the day this episode comes out, it's going to be twenty six eleven. It's one of the darkest days in Mumbai's history, and this episode uh, comes with a small warning. If you or anybody you know were affected by the attacks then please proceed with caution but these stories need to be told these attacks should be remembered not just for the fear mongering of the perpetrators but for the bravery of those affected and in that sense these are important stories to be told the stories i'm about to tell you they have been told before they have been retold and they will forever be remembered the stories i'm i'm telling you today are different stories but from the same time and they have the same things at the heart of them okay the things that are at the heart of these stories are our capacity for bravery a capacity for strength and humanity in the face of brutal brutal adversity that's what these stories are about now most mumbaikers have a very vivid recollection of what went down on that day and i'm no different i'll start with my own very small insignificant recollection of that of that day in 2008 i was a college student i was studying in churchgate and on 2611 i found myself at cst station i was uh, waiting in line for a ticket and as i'm waiting i look up and it's 6:30 in the evening and i look up and i see the dome of the station and it's beautiful and i remember thinking how well made the station is i buy the ticket i get on the train i get home and 2611 for me was a very uneventful day so far but that all changes at 10 pm i'm in my room and suddenly i hear the tv which is in the hall start up i go outside and i see that my mother's watching the tv very nervously right i ask her what's happening and she says that gang wars have, have erupted all across the city right so i sit down with my mom and we start watching the news and little did we know that these weren't gang wars this was going to become something much much bigger in fact it was the biggest terror attack that had ever taken place in our city now at 9:50 that day at cst station vishnu jhende is in his announcer's booth he is the guy who makes announcements at the train station so vishnu jhende is sitting in the announcer's booth and then suddenly from the corner of his eye he sees people are running and as he looks at them he sees that they have blood on their clothes and then he starts registering the gunfire and the explosions that are happening two terrorists enter cst station and they are firing indiscriminately chaos ensues right people are running screaming it's panic vishnu jhende then takes hold of the microphone and starts making announcements he tells people to avoid leaving from platform number 7 and instead they should exit the station from platform number 1 the rear end of it he tells people avoid the main exits head out from the back and he says this in a calm even voice no panic no mention of terrorist activity bullets gunfire nothing just calmly he keeps telling people to exit from the back a lot of people listen to him and make it out from behind the terrorists start listening to the announcements and seeing people leaving away from them they start looking for this announcer and eventually they find him because he's on a raised platform and there's a glass that's there's just one glass in front of him the terrorists look up and they see him in his booth and they start firing at him but it's pierced through the glass in- encasing and start hitting the walls vishnu jhende ducks but he gets hold of his microphone and continues announcing it's unbelievable how many lives this man has saved because he just kept doing his duty the terrorists eventually leave uh, they head out of the station and start making their way into the city as they leave the anti terrorism squads head the chief hemant karkare arrives at the spot and he surveys it it's carnage there's a blood bath 
pools of blood all over the station alongside luggage just left mid transit bodies have been strewn families have been ripped apart Heman Karke surveys this and then he asks where the terrorists have head and when he finds out the direction that they're going in he's alarmed because he realizes that in that way lies Kama hospital and in that hospital there are 300 plus people who are sitting ducks so without thinking twice Heman Karkare leaves on foot alone in pursuit of these terrorists meanwhile at Kama hospital Viju Chavan has gone into labor she's pregnant and she's about to deliver and that's when she hears what she thinks are firecrackers going off she thinks at this point that india has won a cricket match but this suddenly starts turning very dark when nurses and doctors start barging into her room and boarding it up they're, they're shutting all the windows closing all the doors she's confused as to what's happening the lights have been switched off and they tell her that there's possibly an attack at the hospital meanwhile her husband shamu has gone down to collect medicines and he's gone down with their 4 year old son but as he turns a corner he suddenly sees two dead bodies horrified he stops turns back and starts running back up into the ward he reaches the ward gets inside he's picked up an iron rod okay that's the only thing he has for his defense he turns to the nurse and he tells the nurse that you take care of my wife i'll handle whoever's coming through here it's him and a ward boy who are now at the door they're waiting right and together they hatch a plan they say that if anyone breaks through this door then shamu will go for the gun and the ward boy should pounce on whoever comes through and then they lie in wait viju chavan goes into labor and through the excruciating pain she doesn't make any noise and a baby is delivered in the middle of this chaos the baby comes out the doctors jokingly tell her that she should name this child goli the girl has grown up and her name is tejaswini but everyone till date affectionately calls her goli now himan karkare arrives at the hospital and he's called for backup and backup has also arrived uh, in the form of ashok kamte and vijay salaskar two officers along with them are constables now they're at the rear of the hospital and they decide to make their way to the front of it to block the exits of the terrorists so they get into a jeep okay it's heman karkare ashok kamte and vijay salaskar in front and at the back are four constables part of these four constables is one man called arun jadhav so the the jeep makes its way from the back to the front but this was an ambush as they make their way to the front suddenly the terrorists step out of bushes and start firing at the jeep there's no time for anybody to even draw their weapons right the bullets pepper through the the jeep and everybody is shot dead the only person who survives is constable arun jadhav he's been shot but as the bodies fell on him they they became a buffer and he's still alive he hears the death rattle of the people in the car alongside him and then under this pile of bodies he can hear the doors being opened and the terrorists pulling the bodies out and getting inside they then drive off with arun jadhav still in the car and then things take another turn when he's under this pile of bodies and then suddenly one of these constables who has also been shot suddenly his phone rings one of the terrorists takes out his assault rifle and indiscriminately fires at the back again miraculously arun jadhav leaves unscathed and still alive when they've shot up this car they not only killed the people but they also blew out one tire so the jeep is precariously driving along on three tires so the terrorists stop the car and they hijack another one they hijack a skoda and as they leave in the skoda arun jadhav finally manages to claw his way out from under this pile of bodies and he radios for help okay he tells people what has happened he tells them who has been shot up and then most importantly he provides this vital piece of information he tells people that the terrorists have left in a skoda 
Now, naka bandis have been set up all across the city, right? These checkpoints and cops are manning them. And then at a naka bandi at Marine Drive, a Skoda approaches. The car stops 50 meters away from the barricade. And then the high beams of the car light up and the wipers start moving. The cops realize that this has been done to prevent them from seeing who's inside. There's a moment of high tension as the cops wait and the car is steady. And then the car starts reversing. The cops start moving towards it and then the car moves forward and tries to take a U-turn, but it bangs into a divider. Then the terrorist who's in the driver's seat tries to take out a gun and shoot. But a cop manages to get a shot in first. It pierces the neck of the terrorist and he dies. The second terrorist stumbles out of the car. Now people think he stumbled, but instead he takes out an assault rifle and is about to shoot at the cops when assistant sub-inspector Tukaram Omle lunges at the man and grabs hold of his gun. The terrorist squeezes the trigger and a hail of bullets enter Tukaram Omle. But he doesn't let go of the gun. And because he doesn't let go of the gun, the police are able to overpower the terrorist and catch him alive. And that's how Ajmal Kasab was caught. This was an incredible moment, like to catch a terrorist alive, because this person is now, uh, 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 he has a lot of information on him. And they could only do this because of the sacrifice of Tukaram Omble. Now, let's go uh, back in time to about 9.30. And now we're at the Taj. At the Taj that day, a wedding was going to happen. So a lot of guests have come and they're waiting at the crystal room. They're waiting for the bride and groom to make their entry. And then even they assume that firecrackers have started. And a lot of them think that this is just part of the wedding. All of this obviously changes when the Taj staff run into the room and they start shutting all the doors and panic enters the room. At the same time, the grand chef, the grand executive chef of the Taj, his name is Hemant Obroy. He gets a phone call. It's from a chef. And the chef says, sir, there's a shooting going on. And Hemant Obroy assumes that the shooting he's referring to is a film shooting, an occurrence that happens regularly at the Gateway of India that's right outside the hotel. So he says, this is not the time for you to tell me this. But the chef says, no, sir, there's a man with a gun and he's firing at us. And as he's on the phone, he hears bullets going off. And instinctively, Hemant Oberoi tells him, shut all the doors and switch off the lights. Now, this small instruction proves to be extremely vital because the doors are shut, the lights are turned off and people see the terrorists walk past some of these extremely crowded restaurants at the same time at around 10 in another location at Taj, in a restaurant called Shamiana, its 27-year-old manager, Amit Peshwe, sees a gunman enter the lobby and make his way towards Shamiana. He's spraying bullets as he goes. And then he lobs a grenade into the restaurant and it goes off in the middle of it. Amit Peshwe immediately starts acting. He gets all his guests up and he tells them, follow me. At the end of the Shamiana, there's a door and that leads to a transformer room. Okay, so there are in this transformer room, 30 guests, 30 odd guests are there. Right. And Amit Peshwe does a quick survey of his guests. And he sees that one guest has been hit. He's a foreigner and his arm is profusely bleeding. Two guests are crying. It's a couple. And he asks them what's happening. And they tell him a nightmare scenario. They tell him that their 10-year-old son had just gone to the loo two or three minutes before all of this happened. And now he's trapped inside. The mother offers to go in and rescue her son. But Amit Peshwe tells her, ma'am, don't go. I will go. He does this for a couple of reasons. Number one was the fact that he knew the hotel layout better. And number two was that if he was caught, he was sure not to disclose the locations of the 30 other guests. And so Amit Peshwe enters the hotel again. Now put yourself in his shoes. He's 27 years old and he has volunteered to enter into the hotel where terrorists are running rampage. 
right? He makes his way quietly through the hotel, and then he reaches this corridor. And at the other end of the corridor, there's a terrorist, and he sees Amit Peshwa, and he's equally surprised. And he turns his gun, and there's a spray of bullets that head towards Amit Peshwa. Amit jumps and narrowly misses them, and then he sees the terrorist reach in, pull out something, and lob it at him. It's a grenade. He he hears the clink of the grenade as it lands next to him, right? And he looks at it, and as he's staring at it. the thought crosses his mind that this is it this is the end but he keeps staring and then he realizes that the grenade hasn't gone off so he lays still for some time and then he's able to get up and make his way back towards the shamiana and then into the transformer room he meets the parents and he tells them i tried searching for your son but i can't find him and right now it's it's too dangerous he tells them that we have to take care of the 30 guests that we have right now and especially the man whose arm is bleeding he tells them that we have to hope that terrorists will not kill an innocent boy he calls for help and finally his boss re- comes around uh, on the opposite side of the transformer room and he unlocks it and that's how amit peshwa is able to save 30 guests that night this story has an even happier ending because eventually they find the boy and he's reunited with his parents Meanwhile chef Hemant Oberoi has made his way into the crystal room and he sees all these guests here and he realizes that he has to get the guests out of these obvious restaurants right locations where the terrorists are going to make their way eventually so he comes up with a plan he decides to relocate everybody to a place in the Taj called the Chambers the Chambers is a very exclusive club at the Taj where VVIPs uh, conduct their business Now the chambers was a good location according to Hemant Oberoi because it wasn't on any of the brochures and to get access to it you needed a members card. So what he decides to do is he decides to herd all the guests and then take them through the kitchens through the service corridors all these places that only the staff knew about right and so through these back alleys he is able to get them into chambers and uh, large group of people are now there and then the wait begins this long interminable wait now just think of uh, a couple of things here right so as these people are waiting they're in the chambers and the chambers is one of the most opulent places at the taj and at that moment in time no amount of luxury seemed luxurious enough the second thing to think about it's the amazing dedication of the taj staff that night the taj staff now just put yourself in their shoes okay they are also part of this terrorist attack they have also been fired upon these people are well within their rights to stop serving people to stop doing their duty and just behaving like regular scared human beings under attack but the taj staff did not do that as people waited in the chambers cowering afraid the chefs got together and got to work they head to the kitchens and start making sandwiches start distributing water start st- sending out aerated drinks and keeping the general morale of the group high right they're cracking jokes they're engaging people in conversation and not just that they're constantly reassuring guests that help is on the way finally at 3 in the morning of the 27th hemant obroy decides that he's going to try and evacuate the guests so what he does is he comes up with a plan he gets some of the kitchen staff to volunteer to be human chains to be a buffer between the gunmen and the guests in case anything untoward happens during this evacuation and a lot of the chefs volunteer very readily so they form this human chain and a batch of 30 people are being evacuated out they're using these service corridors again and they reach the kitchens but while the people had been waiting in the chambers some of them had spoken to the media and the media had broadcast this without delay so the location of these guests had been revealed on national television and guess who else was watching the terrorists and as soon as they had seen this they sent a man down to find these people so as the first batch of people enters the kitchen suddenly terrorists start firing upon them but the chefs had formed this human chain so they were the ones to get the first spray of bullets 
and that's how a lot of chefs died at the taj in this particular incident but because of their sacrifice the guests were able to make their way back into the chambers and and barricade it and and wait for help to come help came in the morning at around 8 8:30 they're in a bad shape some of them have been fired upon a man is bleeding and he's got his fist in his mouth to prevent himself from screaming out loud right and then at 8:30 suddenly the butt of a gun bangs against the door they don't know what to do they don't know who's on the other side but then they find out that it's the commandos right the commandos are here the door opens and they're slowly led out right as they make their way out into the lobby they're told to go towards buses right they reach the lobby and a lot of people are now happy right they're jubilant they've made their way out some people start taking selfies but their ordeal wasn't over suddenly fire erupts from above them right and now again in another incredible instance of what character these taj staff had the taj staff again forms a human chain around these people as they are escorted onto the buses right they get on the buses and a lot of people duck to avoid the fire and they remain in that position long after they've left the taj finally uh 10 hours after the attack had begun the nsg have arrived the nsg are india's most elite counter terrorism unit these guys are trained to deal with exactly this kind of contingency and they flown in from their headquarters in manesar haryana part of these troops is a man called major sandeep unikrishnan now this man was an extraordinary man who always wanted to be a part of the army so much so that even in school he used to have a crew cut got into the army was did extremely well was part of a lot of tours all across the country from siachen to jammu kashmir to a lot of other parts of the country and what's even more extraordinary was that major sandeep puni krishnan volunteered to come to mumbai he didn't have to but he volunteered he had been watching the news and he realized that he had to be here and do his part the nsg begin evacuating guests uh, they start clearing out the the taj palace and the taj tower these two parts of this giant hotel they encounter terrorists uh, as they're evacuating people in the taj palace they're holed up in on in the on the fourth floor in one particular room right in this fire fight uh, one of the commandos gets hit and as they protect him the terrorists run out the evacuation takes time because this is a very big hotel and the troops are very few and as they're clearing the uh, hotel now imagine it takes 5 minutes to clear every room and there's hundreds of rooms right so it takes a long time and finally we reach the night of the 27th at 11:45 news comes in that there is an employee of the taj who's trapped in the data center the data center is the hub of communications at taj where like every time you uh, pick up the phone and call for reception and stuff it's routed uh, through the data center now in the data center an employee is trapped and she needs to be rescued major sandeep puni krishna volunteers to go on this rescue mission along with some other commandos it's now 2 am of the night of the 28th as they enter the taj palace now when you enter the taj palace there is one grand staircase okay as you make your way up to the first landing you will find a bust of jrd tata the man who created the taj and then this staircase goes in two different directions right left and right and they both reach the next landing now they've reached this uh, the bust of jrd tata and they're about to go up the stairs when suddenly from the darkness gunfire erupts had a spray of bullets heads towards the commandos and it hits one commando right and he's grievously injured major uni krishnan tells the other commandos to take this man to safety and as they're taking him to safety he provides cover fire a vicious firefight ensues and major uni krishnan also gets hit but he makes the decision to follow these people to chase after them right so he decides to go up So he goes up and he starts chasing after them and he goes into the palm lounge his idea is to go through the palm lounge and probably get into the ballroom and outflank the terrorists the last message he leaves on his radio is don't come after me i will handle them 
and then the radio goes dead it's only in the morning when sunlight is streaming through the hotel is when they reach the palm lounge and they see major sandeep puni krishnan's body and they figure out what happened to him as he entered the palm lounge in an alcove hidden behind a table and some cushions was a terrorist lying in wait and as he saw the commando enter he let fire but instinctively as he went down major uni krishnan was able to shoot back there's a spray of bullets from his gun on the wall and below it there's a bloodied shoe and a trail of blood leading away even in death he was able to get at least a shot in this makes the forces barge through and they are able to push back the terrorists into one corner of the hotel thanks to this one action of major uni krishnan now there the terrorists are now holed up in one small corner they are trapped in a, a restaurant called wasabi which has a staircase which connects it below to a, another restaurant called haba bar and that's where the terrorists make their last stand the operation isn't over by a long stretch it takes 10 plus hours of vicious fire fighting before the nsg is finally able to stamp out the last embers of this horrific incident and that's how peace finally returns to mumbai the incidents i'm telling you are just a few of the things that happened from the night of 26th november to the morning of 29th november when this all ended there were multiple locations in bombay where uh these terrorists attacked and a lot of people were affected and a lot of people have displayed immense bravery and courage and there's countless stories yet to be told this whole attack was carried out by about 10 terrorists and at the end of it 166 plus people were dead and 300 plus were injured in many ways after this incident the taj hotel became a symbol for mumbai itself because within a few months they were able to restore this ravaged hotel back to its former glory right and they reopened for guests if you went there today you wouldn't be able to imagine the horrors that took place within these walls that is until you reach the memorial because there you will find the names of every single person who laid down their life in this hotel etched in stone never to be forgotten and that's the reason we tell these stories so that we understand that though we are capable of so much hurt we are also capable of so much healing of so much bravery and so much courage and that's what we got to keep in mind every time this date rolls around until next time stay safe and bye bye